Othership, what is Othership and how is it revolutionizing the way that we work? Well, Othership believes in an other way of working, and that is that we believe people should work where they want, how they want, when they want, wherever they want. And we do that by providing you guys um, access to spaces up and down the country that are, of course, amazing co-working spaces, um, all the way to places which have climbing walls and virtual reality experiences as well. So really to cater to any creative or any person's needs entirely um, for the way that you work. And for being such a good um, partnership with General Assembly, we are actually providing a discount code for specifically the attendees of this event. Um, and my lovely compadre AJ will be dropping them into the chat um, as we go along. Um, we have one so that you can join our networking events, which are twice weekly free, and you can get a 25% discount off any membership to us, um, which is brilliant. So please reach out if you have any questions during the event or thereafter. Um, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions as would AJ. So without further ado, I have the express delight of introducing my dear friend, Jamie Neal, who also happens to be um, an Emmy nominated choreographer, movement director, creative director, um, has one of the most amazing networks in London. And with that, um, ends up having incredibly powerful conversations with people such as the creative director of BMW, uh, to heads of brands, of multi-brands, et cetera, and companies, and essentially finds out from them how have they become so successful, but ultimately 360 themselves and are completely well in themselves and enjoying life, et cetera, whilst living life to the fullest. So Jamie, please um, kick us off and, um, Please illuminate how do we 360 ourselves and become well with the world whilst being massive successes. Over to you, Jamie. Thank you very much. Well, first, I want to say thank you very much, General Assembly and Othership, uh, for bringing me and uh, my podcast 360 to uh, this audience. It's absolutely amazing. I want to big up Othership because they are an amazing community of networkers. It's a very brilliant, brilliant company that wherever you are in the world, you can connect and you can, you can, uh, meet people and have conversations. It's very, very much a free flowing company. I absolutely love it. So I, I really highly suggest if you ever need a meeting, you need a podcast, you need anything, go to Othership because they're absolutely brilliant. And big up as well, General Assembly as well, because they are a massive organization for information. And I personally am such a curious person. So I love communicating. I love learning. So definitely check out all of the things on uh, General Assembly and all the stuff that other ship are offering as well. So back to kind of what we're talking about. So mindfulness. So we have 360 Yourself, which is a podcast, uh, which I founded about two years ago uh, from my interest in uh, self-discovery and information and knowledge. A couple of years ago, I was going through a process of understanding myself and going, how do I become healthier? How do I become a better person? How do I become more mindful? And so I started talking to my friends who are very successful people and how they utilize their experience and their network to be, become more balanced and to be more inspired by the world around them. And so I started asking questions and I started looking at uh, self-help books and reading going, what is the secret ingredient? How do we really achieve all we need to achieve in our real life? And actually the question is, how do we become more of ourselves? How do we become more 360? And the answer is, it starts with you. And so basically I started this podcast questioning all my friends and the context that I have going, how do you live your life from a professional point of view and a personal point of view? So what I'm going to be discussing is how to become more mindful. How do we talk about what conscious thoughts are, our unconscious thoughts are, so the subconscious, thinking about what is our head, heart, and our gut saying. So loads of topics that we, we're going to be talking about. And so we're going to have a Q&A at the end uh, with me uh, about some of the topics that we're going to be talking about in this hour. So I'm very, very excited to chat with you all. So 
Wait, let's let's move to the next one. So what do we mean by 360 or so? So what does that actually mean? Well, it means that I start with myself. I start going, well, what am I feeling? What do I want to do with my life? What do I want to do in this moment in time in my present space? And so what, what I believe is that we are like the Earth's core. So everything in our center is at exactly where it needs to be. If you go too hot in the core, the outside layer of the earth kind of crumbles. You go too cold, again, the outside earth crumbles, the crust crumbles. So we, are, we need to be so balanced and so kind of in that limbo moment, really yin and yang between everything from your work environment, everything in that central place for us to really have a mindful and a healthy lifestyle. So I want to talk about energy, right? There's this thing called the Dyson sphere. If you've ever, if you've ever known about it, it's basically like a mega structure around the earth. And we are connected through, through uh, different conversations, different thoughts. It's all energy, right? We are always connected. And so the idea of a Dyson sphere is basically that all these uh, energy frequencies that we're thinking when we're moving, we're all connected in one. I mean, you can think of like the Lion King, the circle of life that actually exists we are all connected and sometimes you might feel you're alone but you're really really not because we are we're consciously and subconsciously connecting to people constantly it's like the idea of like the six degrees of separation we actually are so connected it's unbelievable and obviously your brain is so complex but we obviously don't really have all the capabilities of, of our brain at the moment maybe in like 20 30 years we might do but our brain is so complex we actually don't know and we can even think about uh, avatar so the tree of codes they believe they have that technology in the roots in the trees in our hearts and our minds that we're all connected and basically this is what we're talking about how do we connect ourselves in our present moment and root ourselves to then be inspired by everything around us and all the opportunities that the universe is sending to us so that's basically what 360 yourself is. It's understanding yourself from a 360, this part here, to see yourself from a 360 all the way around. And we're always sending electromagnetic radiation frequencies, always, because we conduct energy. We emit energy. We admit, admit, admit uh, radio waves and frequencies constantly. So we need to be understanding what type of frequencies we're sending out. So. I want to think about when I'm in the when I'm in the mood in the morning when I'm like in my kind of like in my little bed and I'm like getting out of bed and I'm like what do I feel and I want you to take a moment to what do you what do you what do you feel like because at this moment in time we are so out of our shell out of our space consciously because we are thinking about what we're having for breakfast what kind of cup of tea we're having we are always never really in our body and I always go back to people who are uh, athletes, who are ballet dancers. They're trained to be more aware of your body, to be feeling your toes and all that sort of thing. We need to be more like that. We need to feel our bodies. The, ba the best example I can think of is if you break your b a bone in your body, let's say you break an elbow, you then become so hyper aware of that space that then you're really understanding everything that you do in your space. But if your body works fine, like normal, like you, you don't have any problems, you don't have any aches or pains, you never think about your body, right? So why don't you just think about in the morning, what are you feeling? What are you, in, are you hungry? Are you anxious? Have you got an ache? Have you got a pain? What is your body feeling? And I think that's bringing you back into the present moment to simply just go, what am I feeling? So just take a moment just to try to feel your toes. Like what does your toes feel like now on the carpet? Like there's a thing in LA called earthing, which is basically connecting your your feet to the roots of the ground of the soil basically just try to do that now just think about the feet and how you kind of the fingertips and try to think about what the edge of the fingertips feel like i think that's really really important at this moment in time to really understand what does this moment feel like so moving on so i love this quote by albert einstein and it says logic will get you from point a to point b imagination will take you everywhere and I absolutely love that because, again, it's never about the destination. It's about the process. It's about the journey. And so we question going, what is mindfulness? And we're always in a sort of limbo of emotion versus logic. 
And I'm sure most of you kind of read the book of The Chimp Paradox. So The Chimp Bar Paradox is basically our emotional monkey brain that when you have uh, a conflict with someone, you get defensive, you get kind of overwhelmed with emotion. And sometimes we don't use our logic to act against our emotion. And so sometimes we need to just take a step back, zoom out and zoom out again and go, was that the right decision? Was that the right thing I needed to do? But also your emotion is what propels your imagination. So when you have a creative task, when you're working creatively, what do you do? You emotionally invest in the project or the idea. Your imagination takes off. You don't logically work it all out. You, you emotionally respond to it. So there's a balance of how much do you need of emotion and how much you need of logic to have a really mindful, a, a healthy lifestyle creatively, but also personally. And so we're looking at these three things called the universal mind, the universal consciousness and the universal, uh, universal thought. So the universal mind is a spirit. So it's everything in everywhere. It's, it, if you've seen that film, Lucy, where she takes these, uh, these tablets and then she becomes everything. Her, her mind just goes, boom. Everything that you can feel and sense and smell, you become everything. That's basically the universal mind. Then you have the universal consciousness, which is basically you are aware of everything. You are aware of your actions. You are aware of people that you might have upset in a conflict or you might have uh, done something really nice to someone and you might have felt the kind of the love and everything that they, that they feel for you for that little really simple act that you've done so that's your consciousness and then you've got universal thought which is basically big small visions and dreams so it could be a small uh, vision of i really want to get to a certain amount each month from for my wage. It might do a small vision of I really want to walk two miles a day, and that's a really. And then the big dream might be I really want to own my own production company. I really want to do a, a, a commercial for Nike. I want to I want to work at the Super Bowl. Those are your big dreams. Those are your big universal thoughts, and so they are always kind of manifesting in us. And I, I use that word manifestation constantly because my buzzword manifest because we'll go back to that kind of thought process of what is manifestation how do we use it within our creative life and how do we use it in our personal life so we're moving on so we're now going on to thoughts and memories right so our thoughts are our consciousness so how do we understand what our thoughts are so our thoughts are everything that we are present in our moment your memories are the subconscious thing so the anger the fear, the greed, the hurt, the, most, uh, the motives. So when we think about our ideas when we're working creatively, they are actually from our reference band because there is no such thing as an original idea. Everything is taken from a reference bank. So something that we've seen, it could be a painting, it could be a picture, it could be whatever. That's all stored in our sub subconscious brain. So we need that. And then we have our conscious brain that taps into our subconscious brain to attack the problem or the creative thought that we're doing. But what we don't want is we don't want our subconscious brain to be sabotaging our conscious brain creatively and personally, because why would we want past memories, past experiences to wreck our conscious present thoughts? And this then goes to the idea of manifestation and good positive thoughts versus negative thoughts. And basically what it is is our conscious mind is the commander and our subconscious mind is the obeyer. So whatever the conscious thoughts think and do, the subconscious thoughts will obey. So if you, if you, if you consciously think positive things and reinforce positivity, in those moments of subconscious thoughts in the back going, I'm not good enough, I can't uh, do this, I have, um, uh, what, what do they call it? The, the ability uh, to not rise up to the challenge or imposter syndrome, that's a big one for creators, um, or procrastination. Procrastination is a massive one and we all deal with this individually in our own way and we have tools to deal with it. And I think it's really important to know ourselves because we're all different. We all move and we all walk and talk in different ways. And the way that I make and create is differently to the way that you create. And when I get a negative thought, 
the way that I solve it and the way that I use my tools is going to be different to you. Me personally, I always never ever say the word can't. I don't like it in my thoughts. I don't like it in my words. I always use the word yet. So I can't do that yet, or I haven't got there yet. Or when someone says, oh, you're really successful. Well, no, I'm not successful yet because I'm on a journey. I'm on my way somewhere. Because if you feel like in your conscious thoughts that you're in the present moment, that you're going, I'm so present. I am so brilliant at what I do this moment in time and what I've previously done, you never then move forward. And so I always believe that I'm always moving forward because I never know enough. And I think because I am a Gemini, if you hollow all the Geminis out there, that I honestly want to continuously move forward and I will continuously want to keep learning. So these are these things I keep thinking in my conscious thoughts that I am always wanting to move forward. I'm always thinking, I haven't done this yet. I haven't done that yet. It's not, I can't do it. It's just, I haven't done it yet. And that's totally fine as well. So we think about mindlessness and mindfulness. And I think that is a big kind of like gray area for some people, because what is mind, mindlessness? I mean, for me, it's, it's trapped in by labels. It's automatic, automatic behaviors. It's unaware of what we don't know. And so it's so fascinating, isn't it, about the communication aspect when we're talking to ourselves. I, they always say that the greatest people, or the greatest minds always talk to themselves and it's so true when you are in a moment of kind of flux or situation that the the outside sources might try to label you in these uh lanes that you might be doing going i'm only a graphic designer i'm only a creative director but when you start thinking about creativity as uh as a kind of an energy source that just comes to you it's not something you own it just comes to you then actually because you are creative in one lane doesn't mean that you can't be creative in other lanes. Like I always say that even though lawyers are corporate, they still have to be creative to, to create the case. Brain surgeons have to be creative to navigate and move problems. Basically, creativity is a problem solver. So everyone has an element of creativity. And I think that's what mindlessness is, is, is the unaware of being creative or the unaware of what you don't know. So then we have mindfulness. So we have the creative new levels, consider a multiple views, embrace of new information and aware of what you don't know. So when you're ever present and when you're conscious of your present moment and what you do know, you're more mindful. You go, I know that I'm not very good at that or I know that I am uh, could be better at that or I don't know enough about this. Then you go and research. I think when you're mindlessness, when you have mindless or when you have a mindlessness mind, you're kind of in a blinker, you're blinded. You're just like, I'm in my zone and I'm not gonna move from any other um, comment or communication or conversation to push you forward into evolving adaptive because that's what life is. Tomorrow and yesterday and the moment has just gone, but we've just had it. A second go was there, now it's gone, right? So we're always moving forward. And this piece of information that I'm having to you or giving to you right now, is for now it just maybe just gone just a second ago and so it's about being open to new information that's constantly happening around us all the time and that's what being mindful is it's about opening yourself and going what's around me and be present and focus on things when opportunities arise themselves so i want to think about we can do anything so communication is everything we can do anything we can have these conversations we can do anything that we want so we want to kind of eliminate being trapped by labels to go, I am just a being that likes to create. If I decide to be a writer, then I am a philosopher, then I am a graphic designer, then I'm going to be a director, then I'm going to be a writer. That's totally fine. You can do that. Or you might be, you might totally switch it and go, I want to be an architect. And then I want to be a writer. And then I want to be a director. I mean, there's plenty of people like Virgil Abloh, uh, Picasso is one of those, um, Oprah also as well. I mean, they've got multiple skills to their bow. They have creativity. And when you're creative, you can do anything. And so when you open your mind and be more mindful, the possibilities are absolutely endless. And I absolutely love about that because my mind just goes, well, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. I never go, I can't do that. Can't do that. Can't do that. Because 
Why not? If someone's done it, you can do it. So that's what I always believe. So moving on, I absolutely love this quote as well. People argue based on other own limited mind maps. They fail to see how others share or how others have their own mind maps. And I absolutely love that because when you're so trapped in the way that you think and the way that you think a process should be done, you then get into arguments about how, how other people work. And I absolutely love the idea that I work, so I'm very, very dyslexic and I put my hands up. And so my mind and my process and the way that I view the world is very, very different to someone who's probably academic, who works in the corporate world. But what happens when you are very closed minded is that you don't see the way that other people work. So I problem solve the way that someone else who's very academic problem solves. And that's totally fine. So it's about us being open when we're working in teams creatively, when you have the art director in an agency, or you have the copywriter, or you have the head of marketing, or you have whoever, being really open and being mindful of how they work. Because you might set out a task, or you might set out a project, and they need maybe like a week longer to create uh, an idea or a brief. But you might only need half an hour, because for you, that process is really, really easy. And that's just being mindful of how, ever, uh, how every, everyone works around you. And for me, that's also when you start becoming a leader, that, even, that helps even more to be more mindful about how everyone feels and moves around you and how they think and how they process. So that's really, really good. So I absolutely love this quote. So when we're feeling trapped or moments of panic from the outside, what triggers can, what triggers can we do, right? What are the triggers that, that hinder us from being more mindful, that puts us in a state of flux? And I love these words because I use them all the time with my friends and with myself. So gratitude, I always do every morning. So I always think about three things every single morning that I am um, enjoying in my life. That could be, I've got a really nice chicory coffee waiting for me downstairs. I've got my family downstairs. I do a job that I absolutely love. Like, look at me. I'm talking to hundreds of people from around the world, talking about something that I passionately love is helping people and communicating everything that I've learned from people and everything that I love about mindfulness. So that's something that I absolutely love. And this is the gratitude that I have. So we thought about focus, we've got attitude, we've got being still, breath. Breath, I can't stress enough how incredible breath is. It is literally, if you don't breathe, you basically go, that's it, you, you go, you're, you're done. What happens when we have arguments, when we kind of <laughs> lose our breath? We then stop thinking. When, what happens when we have anxiety? We, we <laughs> do that again. If you just breathe, be still, a lot of life problems become a lot simpler because breath is everything. Breath in meditation, breath to, to understand uh, conscious minds and uh, con uh, subconscious minds. Breath is everything. If you, de if you de deep into the breath work and to understand how breath can help you in your life, when you take that first breath in that morning, that <sighs> just feels great. It feels really present. And we're not present if you don't acknowledge how amazing breath is. Then the last one, intention, everything. What is your intention? When you have a relationship, most of the time, when you get to like month one or month two, month three, you then have an intention, you have a conversation going, where's this at? Where's it going? When you, have, when you jo join a new company, what's your intention? Why do you want to be here? It's all these sort of things that we want to connect ourselves to what's my intention in life what's my intention to anything that i come to as a person what can i bring to this situation i think that's really really important and it's it's even more important to understand what are your triggers in life what can you do to understand what triggers you so uh, a lot of it is writing down journals so a lot of triggers can be comparison i think a lot of people compare too much and now we have social media which compares so much for me personally instagram and all this other i don't really use tiktok and uh, these other things but instagram for me is a great source for inspiration and i use it to see other p 
people's work. I think that's amazing because I can't go to a gallery at this moment in time because of lockdown. But what I can can do is go to Instagram and find an artist that I like and just look at look at what they're doing. I think the downside when uh, people get triggered is the comparison of work, comparison of path. And I think what these what you need to root is when you have those moments of triggers is to then go back into your path, your intention, your gratitude. So yes, I haven't done this yet. I haven't done that yet. But my intention is I'm doing this path because I know where my path is leading. I'm doing this, not doing that, because I know this is where I need to be. And I breathe through my anxiety triggers. I don't think about, sometimes I think people can compare because their path is not going the way they need to be. And that's life. But it's believing in that your path is going to get you to where you need to be. And that's really, really important to know. So I think a lot of time triggers can come from comparison, particularly because digital media, digital social media is everywhere. And we're so connected, but so distant. And so it's now understanding what your triggers are and recognizing what to do with them. If you know your trigger is you, for instance, you get anxiety over snakes. Me personally, I hate snakes. So I don't put myself in a room with snakes because I hate them. I don't like going to the zoos and seeing snakes. I once did a job and I had a snakes in the back of the car for this music video. And I literally just almost freaked out. And I said to the director, I was like, I'm so sorry. I can't do that because it's going to put me in anxiety space for the rest of the day. So I was like, I'll recognize the triggers. I'll take myself away and I won't go there. So recognizing and knowing from your conscious mind, so go, I'm in present, to go, what can I do to put myself not in triggers? And your subconscious brain experience and examples of what, uh, when you've been in triggers will help your conscious thoughts to take you outside of those moments where you think you're going to get triggered, if that, any, if that makes sense. So I want to know is, what can influence you? How can we use simplicity? So simplicity is everything. I mean, we complicate things in life. I love that uh, amazing photo of when um, the sailors and people who were going away for war and they're like leaning out of the, uh, the, the, the ships and they've got their partners kissing them saying goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. And it's going like that was so simple because they didn't have anyone else. They didn't have Bumble. They didn't walk away and go, I'm going to go on Grinder. I'm going to go on Bumble or in a circle. They just they were like, I'm going to wait for you. I'm going to write to you. Now we have all these crazy amazing piece of technology like Snapchat and everything that makes it so complicated to really connect with people because you then have options. And I think when then as soon as you have options, your life then doesn't become simple. It becomes really chaotic and noisy. And so we want to think about how do we use simplicity to our best advantage? For me, an example is your walk that like you do, let's say you do a walk from A to B, might be from your home, to your shop and the shop might be 10 minutes away right and you do it maybe like four times a week how many times do you actually just do the walk and focus on the walking right think about the color the touch the smell the sight everything around you has been curated by someone who's designed it everything around you is influenced by something so when you do a walk and your mind is racing, it's got so many different things going, I've got to do this brief, I've got to do this deck, I've got to speak to this client or whatever it is, you're not giving your, your brain chance to focus on one simple task, walking there and back and seeing what's around you. It's sort of like a meditation, oh, I, I think it's a meditation. It's a meditation to let your subconscious brain do its thing because actually what happens when you sleep most, most people might know this, is that it's calibrating and uh, formulating and summarizing everything that you've learned in the day. And then your subconscious brain does its thing, does its magic, puts it into a nice little present and delivers it, delivers it to you in the morning, right? So if you're always consciously thinking about things, you never let your subconscious brain slightly take over and do something. And I, for me, I, for me, I always do this thing was when I have a creative block. 
sometimes I get anxious and I'm like, when am my creative wave going to hit me? And I'm going to, I'm going to get this amazing idea, right? What I do is I take myself away. I go, you know, my conscious brain is not thinking at this moment in time. It needs to take a break. I go for a walk. I don't change, uh, I don't change, um, uh, well, no, I don't answer my phone. I don't do anything like that. I just simply walk and let my subconscious brain take over, see the sights, see colors, touch, smell, whatever it is on a walk that I do. Um, and then what happens is my subconscious brain fixes the idea that I was so stuck on because I've just let my, my brain do its magic. I don't know understand why it does that, but my brain does it and it does for everyone. Let your brain do its thing. Don't co- try to combat the, neg- the negative thoughts going, I can't do it, I can't do it. When's this amazing thought, this thought's really bad or whatever. Just let your brain do its thing because it, it, it will, the things that you're thinking here, you go for a walk, it goes in the back, it sorts it all out, and suddenly you come back and you go, ha, ah, why didn't we do that? Oh, why didn't we do that? Totally makes sense. And I can't explain it to you, but that's what happens. And so it's very exciting to think about the simplicity of life, to really see what's around you, because everything is curated, everything is designed, everything is thought through by someone else. So when you take a moment to go, I'm sitting on a bed, or I've got a, I've got a wooden desk in front of me, someone chose that wood, someone chose the way it was put, someone chose the length. So when you think about yourself from a mindful point of view, you've got up in the morning, you've really aligned yourself, you're content, you're present, you then can step out into the world and see it from a different angle, see it from a person who has designed that, see it from the focus of simplicity. That's when you get your influence because you've done everything else beforehand. You've got yourself into your mantra. You've got yourself into a state of mindfulness. And now you can go out into your space and see the world around you and see the influences that are around you, the opportunities when someone offers you a, um, a, a bread or a coffee or a newspaper, you're able to accept the risk the, the response from the person that you probably engage with and you're able to communicate that effectively because you're in your head you're not outside your head thinking about multiple different things and what the one thing that i kind of didn't understand beforehand and i have this on my hand uh, tattooed which is you can which you can see everyone can see and it's called it well basically it means go with the flow right? I think everyone, everyone has understood that. Um, go with the flow means basically go with the river, right? Don't go away from the river. Don't go side, don't go whatever. Just go with the flow, right? So if you went with the flow and you went with what's around you and the opportunities, you would always kind of just go, yes, and do that. And then you do that and then do that. And that's external, right? But what someone wise once said to me, he, uh, he's a partner for a very big uh, consulting company. And he said this thing to me. He said, it's not about the flow outside of you. It's the flow inside of you. Think about that. What are you feeling, right? So I want to give you an example. Let's say you went to a coffee shop, right? And, some, and you didn't, maybe purposely didn't go in there to get a coffee, right? But someone in the coffee shop, the barista said, you know what? it's your lucky day i've got two things for you they're totally free you can either have a latte or you can have a coffee so a, a latte or a, an americano right and you go on cool that's going with the flow that's in my extremity that's outside right that's my opportunity life is presenting me this or life is presenting me that right and naturally what i would do is go with the flow and go yeah of course I, and then i would decide which one i would want i go mm, okay i want that one but then if you think about going with your internal flow the better question is Am I even thirsty? As soon as I think, thought about that, I was like, I don't want either. So we have these experiences and these opportunities in front of us, but we don't necessarily need to take that route or take that route or take the opportunity because I don't feel like that's authentic to me because I'm not really, not really thinking about what that is or what that is. I'm really thinking about what I want and what I feel. And that goes back to the morning is going, what do I feel today? Am I, am I hungry? Am I tired? Am I anxious? Are my bones aching? If someone says to me outside, do you want to go for a run or do you want to go for a walk? Well, I think about myself and I go, 
what do I feel like today? Some people would act on impulse and emotion go, yeah, would it be amazing to go for a run? Then maybe your logic brain would go, you know, actually, no, I think I'm really sore and I'm a bit hungry. So maybe I'll go for a walk and then we'll go for dinner. And that's your brain, your body just merging into one to go, how am I feeling? What is my thought process? What is my flow? And I think that's a really, really good one to go, what is your flow? So you go with the flow internally. And so that's basically the idea of simplicity for me is slowing everything down, making sure our, our conscious thoughts are not going here, then everywhere, that we tap into our present moment and to, see, to focus on one thing, whether it is a walk or we're writing a journal or we're washing dishes, let your brain do its thing because there's so much noise now with social media, TikTok. I mean, tick, I see people scrolling all the time. It's brilliant because we're connecting, but there's so much noise and it, it gets too confusing for me. So it's all about the perspective of how we see life. So the balance of selfishness and selflessness. I mean, I mean that is, for me in itself is so confusing because how can you be selfless and be selfish? Like, what is the actual difference? And I love this Dalai Lama. He says, our prime purpose in this life is to help others. And if you can help them, at least don't help hurt them. Basically, I love that. I love that if you can't help them, don't hurt them. And so what is the difference between self, selfish, selflessness and selflessness? It's, it's one of those things, isn't it? And then what's in the center? Self-care. Self-care is basically the ability to consider how everyone around you is feeling when you're taking care of yourself. And I always believe that it's important to be selfless. So to always help people when you can. If it hinders your, you emotionally, physically, maybe have a logical approach to that and go, maybe I can't really help you here, but maybe I can show you someone or introduce you to someone that may be to help you. And so if you're really responding to energy, like I am, I'm always meeting people and I take on their energy. I take on their pain always. And I have to always think about my own anxieties, my own triggers when I'm working with people and when I'm meeting my friends and hearing their thoughts and being a good listener, not a hearer, a listener because hearing and listening is, is totally separate and we'll go on to that later on but I want to think about when we are being ourselves and when we need time to have self-care which is really really important we're not being selfish we're thinking about ourselves because unless you think about yourself you can't help anyone around you when you're tired you can't work if you need eight hours of sleep or you need three hours of sleep or you need 10 hours of sleep, that's what you need, right? You can't let anyone around you affect the way that you need to self care. And so obviously when you're being selfish, that's like hurting someone or injecting yourself into someone's path. And, and there's a really good author called Simon Sinek, who I'm sure most people know, who's an amazing motivational speaker. And he says one of these stories of, he says, there was a donut stand and it was those free donuts and some people wanted to wait for them and some people didn't. And there was a line and he went up to the front of the line, grabbed a donut and then took it away. Right. And he said this really interesting thing. He said, you can grab anything that you want from life. You just can't tell someone else or get in the way of anyone else grabbing that free donut. And that's basically selfishness. When you inject yourself in someone else's path purposely to get your own reward, which is the donut, that's wrong. That's selfish. Selflessness is helping and caring for people. And there's this quote that I always love. It's called give, give, get. You don't get, get, give. If you try to take, 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 no one will ever give. You need to give and give and give. And eventually the universe and people around you well, you will receive back, but you can't be the person that's manipulating the situation to give so that you can get, because that doesn't work. That then, that, that then defeats the point. You need to understand that everything always comes around. So life, again, 360 circle, 
Dome Sophia, Dyson Sophia, everything connects, right? So when you help and you give advice and you give contacts and you help as much as you possibly can around you, ultimately it will help you in the longer in the longer journey distance because you are helping the people around you. And they will notice, honestly, if you do it authentically, people will notice and they will help you out because that is the law of attraction. So again, if you don't know what the law of attraction is, it's basically anything you think or feel, negative or positive, gets magnetic back to you. It's a magnet, it's, it's, it's a pulse, it's a frequency. So if I'm intentionally, word intentionally, if I'm intentionally manifesting to really help this person because they're stuck on a project or they're stuck on this idea, I'm going to also receive back eventually, not right away because it might not work right away. But if I just authentically keep pushing out good, good energy to help people, ultimately it will come back to me in tenfold. And so I have always believed when I have ideas creatively, I never shield my ideas. I like to think about sharing everything. So because we, what we don't want to do is keep con uh, consciously creating the same thing because then we're not growing, we're not moving forward, we're not risking anything. So what I consciously do is give everything, give all my ideas, give everything away, right? And then I'm left with nothing in a sense. So then I have to de delve deep into something new to create something new. What we always do, we always, we always go back onto our laws. We always go back onto the things that make us comfortable. And then we always go back to things that have always worked because it's a thing that we know because we're, we're beings of comfortability. We like things that, to be comfortable. But actually, if you want to keep evolving and keep moving forward, it's actually releasing everything and being selfless and give everything, all your ideas, to then delve into your psyche, to delve into new experiences, to then provide fresh new perspective. That's really, really important. And I really love that idea of like getting rid of the old stuff to bring in the new stuff. We then go on to what is your truth? I mean, what is your truth? I mean, we, everyone talks about head, heart, gut. That's really, really important. And we think about the idea of decisions. So knowing your truth, not camouflage with nonsense. We need to put ourselves in a place to receive the truth that is around us because it's such a noisy place. And so how can you think about your head, your heart, your gut, if you're not your honest self, if you're not truthful, truthful for yourself or what you really, really want and the decision that you really want. And then we go back to a good decision or a bad decision. How do we manifest these sort of things? How do we choose between this and that? And then we go, we go back into the head, the heart, the gut, and the intention and the manifestation. And then therefore, there isn't gonna be a bad decision or a good decision. It's just a decision, it's just a different journey. And so I've always thought about my head and my heart. So again, logic, emotion. Your emotion is your heart, the logic is your head. So sometimes you go with your logic brain and you go, I'm gonna do this, because I think this is a really great opportunity to work with this person. Your emotion comes in, your heart, you go, am I really in this? Can I really um, put myself or see myself in this project, in this, in this uh, photo shoot that you might be doing, in this um, collaboration with this new person? And so then we then go to our gut. So our gut is going, what, what do I really feel? What do I, th this is sort of the last thing, the, the decision maker. You go, what does your gut feel? And your gut actually has an emotional intelligence, believe it or not. And so you're actually go, going through three different motions with your intention of going, what do I want to do? What is my decision? But ultimately, the decision isn't good or bad. It's just a decision. And I think people get stumped over this about what is the decision that I need to do. And they come to someone, they go, I've got this problem. I've got this project. I don't know what to do. Is it a good decision or a bad decision? And I always go, just decide, like make a decision, be more simplistic, decide to do that. Don't think regrets after you've done this decision because that path is what you've taken and that path will lead you to another path. But maybe, just maybe, that path is what you needed to take to get to where you ultimately needed to get to. Rather than going, oh, I should have taken that path or I should have did this decision to get into that because 
we don't know. We don't know if that path would have got you to where you get to. All we can do is do the best of the knowledge that we have in front of us and the decisions that we choose and the opportunities that are in front of us to make the best decision for us, not for anyone else, for us. So I love this idea of like levels of influence. And so this goes back to the idea of 360 to 360 the world. So you have in the center, if you can, if everyone can see, the body, the choices, and the attitude, right? And then you have around that, you have environment, friends, family, weather, work, economy. And then you have around that, which is the world itself, social institutions, global warming, animal rights, human rights, and ozone. So what can you control? Well, you can definitely control everything in your environment. So you can definitely control work. You can't really control weather. You can definitely control family. You can definitely control friends. In the world, what can you control? Well, you can definitely control human rights. You can definitely help that situation. You can definitely help in the situation animal rights. You can definitely help the situation of global warming. You can definitely help the situation of ozone and the way that we're conducting our businesses with the factories and all that sort of thing. But what can we ultimately, firstly, instantly help and change? Family, friends, work. Those are our three things in our environment. And then once we've analyzed those, then how do we change and adapt and also improve the world around us? What can we do as an, as an impact to help the world around us? And I think a lot of people do outside in. And this goes back to my idea of what 360 yourself is. It's not 360 the world, it's 360 yourself to 360 outwards. The, we have, again, imagine the, you've got the core of the earth, which I said at the beginning. You go that and it radiates out. It doesn't radiate in, it radiates out because the core is really, really, really hot. So it goes outwards that way. That is also like our core, our good energy, our frequencies. When we have a good day, it radiates out. It goes to our friends, our family, uh, the work, the economy. It goes to everything around us. And then hopefully, if you believe in that we all connect together, and then we have the Dyson fear, which is what we said at the beginning, it all radiates again into the world around us. So your social institutions, the global warming, everything connects. If we all have a positive attitude and we all have a really good sense of frequency, it all connects into, in, in a massive circle of life. And so think about the core first, then think about your environment and then think about the world. Because I think some people skip the environment and they go, I've got to help mankind. I've got to help all the animals in the world. I've got to help all the humans in the world. I've got to help global warming. And it's the wrong way of doing it. It's about going in to out. How can you be in your, what you need to do from your body, your choices, your attitude, your perception, the way that you see and the way that you respond to everything around you, being your friends, family and work, then go to your environment. How can I change? How can I impact my environment with uh, the economy, with my work? And then again, going out again, once you've kind of got that circle, it's going out again. How can I impact the world around me? So I've done my environment. That's my close circle. Then I've got the world around me. How do I do that? And so changing your vision. What? So why and how? What is your why? I'm, I'm sure everyone has probably heard of, again, which I've, which I've referenced before, it's Simon Sinek um, and the reason why. Oh, and he has a book called Why Leaders Eat Last. And I love that idea of what is your why? And then once you understand what your why is, it's about how. How do you do what your why is? And I love this quote, a man's reach must extend beyond his grasp by Robert Browning. And I love that. I enjoy reaching for something that is out of my graph because I, I'm then moving forward into a different me. I'm always adapting, I'm always moving forward. So changing our vision or changing your vision to what you want to become. I think a lot of people get stuck in this whole negative cycle of procrastinating, of just being, I don't know, stuck, stuck in your own mind. And then you lose sight of why you do it. And then you lose sight of how you're going to do it. And so the how is really, really important. And the why is really important. I don't think you can have either or because your why is going, I really love doing this because it's my passion. 
And then when you go, I'm really passionate about, I don't know, graphic design or being a scientist. Once you've got your passion, you then need the backup of logic of going, well, how do I do it? How do I bring together these amazing people in this project that I want to do? How do I do this amazing idea that I'm going to bring Tesla with Apple, with Burberry, for instance? How do I do it? What's my why? Why do I want these people? Why? What's their why? And then what's my how? How am I going to connect these people together? How am I going to change what I want to do? How do I want to pivot my career or my projects that I'm doing? How do I change with the people that are surrounded with me? How do I change how, how I interact and communicate with everyone around me? And then that, that's why it's about understanding those aspects of your life. Why and how? And they're very simple things. I love the question. When I'm in a moment of kind of stillness, I ask myself, are you happy? And then my response is either yes or no. If it's a no, I go, why am I not happy? How do I change it? If I say yes, I'm happy in this situation, I go, why am I happy? Well, it's this and this. And then I don't need to go a how. I don't need a how for that one because I'm content, I'm happy. It's the no that you have to you have to worry about, or not worry about, but make yourself focus on that because you need to know why you're not happy in this situation. And if you're not happy in this situation, how do you change it? Why do you need to change it? Can you can you do the things that you're doing now and being happy? Some people do. Some people spend the rest of their life doing something they're really unhappy about, and they never do something about it. But if you're someone like me that who's passionate about something and I have to really love what I do because we only have a certain clock on ourselves, like time is really, really short. I remember when I was 18 and I look back at myself now and go, wow, the people and the things that I'm doing now is absolutely incredible. And I always have this picture of myself. It was from um, Anthony Hopkins and he um, has his young self on a phone on his homepage. And he always looks at it going, we did, we did all right, kids. And I actually have that on my phone. I have my young self. And when I have moments of kind of doubt or triggers or the why, what is my why? Why am I doing this project? Why am I doing this? Or why am I putting through this struggle? I then go back to going, because my younger self wanted me to do this because I really love this. Remember the time when you wanted to be where you are at now. And then I think about that moment. I go, wow, absolutely. Life is much more simple and doing something that I love. I don't work in the, in the factory. I don't work in a corporate. I don't work in an office. I actually work freelance, working with the most amazing creative brands in the world. And I speak to, and I have friends in my network that are the most crazy, innovative, imaginative people in the industry. And I go, these are the people I only wished that I wanted to connect to. And I have, and I do. And so that's my why. I then go back to go, well, that's what, th that is what I wanted to do. And I'm here now. And so changing your vision. And if you're not happy where you are in this moment in, in time, go, you, go to your why and go to your how. So trust and time. I love this. Because I, I, we always, I am, I'm a rusher. I like to rush to get to a destination. I like to get through the process. That's what I, that's what I originally do. And then a couple of years ago, I had to change my mindset because I was like, I'm not really living in the moment. I'm not being present. I'm not enjoying what is actually happening around me because I'm always focusing on the future. And so what you have to do is imagine yourself on a roller coaster, right? Or a carousel. That actually your things are passing by and you're going, oh yeah, okay, enjoying, enjoying. Okay, right. But I want to get to the end or I want to get to the high. And then you go to the roller coaster, roller coaster and then you get to the high again. But actually, what you need to do is take, all the, take everything in. Yes, enjoy those highs, but also enjoy how you're getting to those highs and those lows. And the process and the journey is everything. It's about trusting in the process, trusting in the moment that you are having right this moment, that you need to learn this. I always think about my journey is that I don't always get everything I want, I want when I'm pitching projects or when I want to do something. And I am absolutely fine with getting no's and rejections. I love a no rejection because it means that I, don't, I can't do this right now. 
and I maybe need to do something else at this moment in time and come back to that. And so for me, the, my process and journey is accepting that there are going to be loads and loads and loads of notes, and it's never really personal. Generally, it's either the universe telling you that it's not the right time now. And there's a great book by Matthew McConaughey called The Green Lights. And in this book, this one quote, I love it. He said, it's a no now, but it might be a yes later on. And that goes back to the journey and time and process and trusting that the universe, the space around you that you're conducting yourself with, is, has got you. It has got you in this journey. It's got you where you need to be. And you don't need to worry because it will come. There's also another book, which I absolutely love as well, called Late Bloomers. And I think because of the, the boom of the internet, because of the marks uh, from Facebook and um, all these other amazing tech people from Snapchat, uh, or Snap, Snapchat has allowed us to think and reflect on ourselves in a negative light that we're not where we need to be right this second. And we need to be these successful, brilliant people when we're younger. And actually, th that doesn't make any sense because years and years and years ago, we, people were very successful in their late 30s and 40s before the internet, maybe in the 80s and 90s, because that's what happened. You learned 10 years, 15 years, 20 years of your career, and then you became really successful and you really then found the glory of you, the struggle that you've done. Now we have all these people becoming really successful um, really early on. And then you go like, well, I, my career hasn't, hasn't taken off yet. So does that mean I failed? No, it just means you haven't learned what you need to learn in your journey to get to where you need to get to. I love that, uh, obviously everyone knows Nike. Um, one of the co-founders was 36, 37 when he founded Nike. I mean, one of the biggest companies that is a game changer in the social and cultural space was 37 when he co-founded Nike. I mean, Oprah also was very late in her life. Loads of people have got on uh, into their process, their kind of, their mojo later on in life. And so I think it's about understanding that the process, the trust, the journey is on your side. Then it goes on to listening, not hearing, which I said earlier. So how do we listen and not hear? What is the difference? Because listening is about being attentive. It's about understanding. It's about having a reaction. Hearing is just, it's just a kind of conveyor belt. It's just a mechanical thing. I'm hearing, I go, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I understand. When you're in an argument and someone says, you're not listening, you're just hearing me and then you go no, no no i hear you and it's just going in and out but actually it's not understanding what the listening is it's understanding okay i understand what you're saying i'm taking it in my views of this your views of that okay let's just find a middle ground how do we how do we solve this problem and i think that's i think a lot of time in this process and journey it's about that balance of listening and not hearing because we want to listen to what the universe and what the journeys uh, the journeys having around us we want to listen to the opportunities we want to listen to where we're at this moment in time to be mindful not to be mindless and that's really really important and so we want to go on to the idea of this journey about the past the present and the future so if you live in the past you're depressed if you're living the present you're content and if you live in the future, you'll be anxious. Now, I love this idea about the four levels of life. So you have in the left-hand corner, you have learning years, earning years, legacy years, and golden years. And so it goes back to this idea about process and journey. Like when we are, when we, baby, 30 years ago, you learned for about 20 years and then you have your legacy years, which, you would, you, which then you would cash in on all the experiences and all the struggles that you've had, right? And then we then have our golden years, which is probably like our 50s or 60s, is when you actually really understand what life is about, everything about life. So think about your life as a, as a stepping block from learning to earning to legacy to golden. And you're not going to get your golden years in your earning years because that's not possible because you haven't worked up to it. You're not going to get your legacy years and your learning years because you're just learning. And so go into that present moment of being content and don't worry about the future and having anxiety to go, 
am I going to get to my golden years? Or in your legacy years, looking at the past and going, oh, what did I learn? I did learn enough in that, that past and now I'm a bit depressed. Or, I, uh, or in the past going, mm, I should have taken this job or I think I should have said this to someone. Because then you're, you're going to find yourself in the past. You're not being present. Don't worry about too much about the future because that hasn't even happened yet. Be in the present moment and be content about the opportunities and the things that you need to focus on. So I like to uh, think about all these different words that really, really help me when I'm writing my journal, when I'm thinking about my life. And I love these words of authenticity, belief in others, caring, commitment, uh, cooperation, dedication, devotion, connection, effort, freedom, forgiveness, uh, friendship, gratitude, honesty, hope, integrity, uh, attraction, patience, optimism, and respect. Definitely have these written down in your journals, in your mantra books, because they're so helpful when you just need a bit of motivation, when you think about what is my devotion? What's my dedication? How am I committing myself to a project? How can I forgive someone? Because forgiveness is a brilliant tool to not harbor negative energy. How do I be patient with someone? How do I have the optimism that we're going to have a brighter future out of lockdown? How can I have more respect for the people that are, I'm working with? How do I have belief in others and their abilities when you're working in a partnership or when you're working in a company? And so as I'm finishing up this presentation about mindfulness, I want to write down some of the amazing advice and quotes that we've had on 360 Yourself. And I, I, we've had about 100 episodes now on our 360, but these are the couple ones that I really, really love. And I love the first one. So a good show must give comfort. And I love that from uh, Olivia nominated Jeremy Heron. Um, this too shall pass. Great one from Sue Higgs, because you might have a really bad time now but the future will move forward and the future will be better. Uh, next one, without challenge, there is no achievement. Absolutely love one. Don't stop dreaming. Yes, absolutely brilliant. Uh, everything has a beginning, middle and end. Amazing one, because obviously it does. Things always finish, things always begin. And I think if you hold on too tightly to projects and things that you don't want to end, you'll be very, very sad at the end because then you'll be in the past rather than going, how do I be in the present at the moment? I'm enjoying the beginning, enjoying the middle and enjoying the end. Moving on to the last one, your inner thought will always be there. And I love that. You always have that, you know, that little voice when you're kind of doing your project or you're thinking about yourself and you're like, oh, and that, that little voice comes up and you go, I can do this. I can do this. That's what you need to train. You need to train that voice to be spewing out positive thoughts and pos positive manifestation. So, I want to thank you, everyone. So I want to thank everyone who's joined us today. I want to thank Othership. I want to thank General Assembly for having me in 360 Yourself here because it's been an absolute joy. And I love that everyone from around the world, I don't know who, who's here. I've, I've been scouring uh, the, the, the chat about where everyone is in the world, and I absolutely love it. So I want to say thank you for taking an hour of your time to be here. Um, we're now onto kind of Q&As. Um, if you want to take a moment to look at 360 Yourself, we're available on all Apple podcast uh, platforms, Spotify, all the kind of podcast things. Uh, find us on Instagram on uh, at 360 hashtag, uh, so underscore yourself and at Jamie Neal, JN. Um, so what we're going to be doing, I'm going to be launching into kind of the chat and the Q&As. Um, let me just have a look. Can I attach myself to a QA? and a I'm just trying to... Thank you. I'm just going to open up my Q and A's. Stop sharing. Right. Okay. I'm going to answer some of these questions. So, uh, da, 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 da. how can we make a better decision that is true to ourselves when you have an inner conflict? Um, so, I think for me personally, it's about what is your intention? It's about going, what do I really, really want to do in my life? What do I really want to have? I want to understand my objective in my life. I want to understand what my end journey is. And I think the inner conflict can be a simplest version. I think sometimes we complicate too much about it. And I think sometimes we have moments that we're thinking or we're Mm. We're, we're, we're considering too many um, outside influences in our, in our decision making. And I think if you simplify 
what those kind of conflicts are, I think you'll have a better understanding about what the best decision is for you. Not the right decision or the wrong decision, but the best decision for you. Um, so how do you get rid of thoughts and feelings about someone like a love interest that does not work well for you? Oh, okay. This is a big one. So hope. Hope will latch on to a previous lover. If, if and when you lose hope from a relationship, you then, you then cut ties with that person. You then send away your uh, memories and everything and that sort of thing. When you hope for something, when you have that intention, that hope that it will come back, you'll then still always be lingering. You'll always still be wanting to connect to that person. So when you lose that hope from that love interest, then things and time can get better. Um, one more about, can you talk more about uh, the con subconscious and the conscious are connected? How to most focus and be product productive from that? Well, I think, so we need, we need both of them. So we have a, a reference memory bank from behind. So we, everything that we see, feel, touch, everything is recorded in our subconscious brain. And then our conscious brain takes this information and then uses it to our advantage to conduct ourselves and to make appropriate decisions and to help us guide our intention forward and to manifest things a bit for, more forward. So I think it's about, for me personally, it's about understanding um, our intention and then writing out what you want to do. And then what will happen or what you, what you foresee in this project or your personal life? Like, what do you see? How do you see yourself? Like, use that manifestation. Use that vision to see the future, right? And then you use your conscious brain, your logical brain, and your emotional brain to make, a, to make decisions about how you're going to best fitting to get to that future, to the future self. How to be really productive about your time. Take off, like, don't listen to Instagram. Take, take yourself off Twitter and all that sort of thing because they're just awful things that get in your way of productivity because then you get subconscious thoughts from outside influences from Twitter that might be a troll or whatever and then they somehow creep into your conscious mind. So that would be the first thing. Um, what can I do for performance anxiety? Ooh, okay, best one. Breathe, breath, mantras. The, my favorite mantra is, I am the captain, captain of my ship I'm the master of my fate. And I say this to every person that I meet to gear them and to give confidence to go into anything. Um, I also use um, a, uh, like a sort of like avatar of myself, like the better version of myself. And I call myself this person, the JFN. And like Sa uh, Beyonce has Sasha Fierce, Prince has one, everyone has one um, that they are the alter ego. And I use my person the person that I want to become before I go into every meeting, before I go into anything. And I imagine what this person would be like, how he would talk, how he would be, what his fears are, what his strengths are. And that's the one I usually always usually do. I take five minutes, maybe like 10 minutes to breathe and really get into this, this version of myself that I really want to become. Um, next one. Where can we learn more about how the brain works and how best to hack it? Um, where can, I mean, there's loads of books on it. I mean, we talk about uh, this. Uh, there's books on. Uh, it's called the magic. Uh, there's books on um, the the ch the chimp paradox is probably the best one I think because that obviously talks about what we talked about today is about the emotion and the logic because that basically is our brain how we logically think about things and how we emotionally think about things. So I think that for me is the best one is that, um, the chimpanzee, uh, the chimp paradox is the, the best book I think to learning more about your brain. Are you aware of cognitive impact on your, on our brains actually by all the chaos and noise? For example, watching TV and scrolling on your phone, I believe that there are, and there are concerns on the brain. It would be good to hear what you think. Yeah, I, for me personally, there is so much noise and I, I, for me, have to drown it out. I think what was great about kind of Instagram and Facebook is that the algorithm changed because they, they made it so everything that you like was increased. And then what happened with Twitter is that they didn't use the algorithm. And so it was just loads of noise and loads of comments everywhere and it wasn't really filtered. And so for me, it's about getting rid of all the kind of external things and like where someone else might be in their career, 
not looking at like deadline the the um the website which has all the kind of hollywood stuff i kind of get rid of all that and then i go in, i tap into what i really really want and where i see myself and my agents um well my agent uh, did this really thing called the brand house and it was basically like a a, a house of where i want to be and it was a diagram of like where I want to be in five years, where I want to be in 10 years, why and how. And I use that to really navigate my career and, and to not go and be, and to kind of use jealousy because jealousy is awful. I never, I never get jealous. I always feel really humbled by my friends who do really, really well because then I'm part of their success. I always think about that's amazing that they're doing over there. I then go back to kind of, I don't really want to do that. And that's not really where my journey is because if I start doing that, I'm going to miss out on what's happening here. And so I need to focus on what this is. Um, uh, number one, how do you personally co cope with negativity and negative people? Um, I, remove, I remove myself. Uh, simple. I don't uh, think about these people. I literally just remove myself. I literally cut them out of my life. I, I can't stand negative people. I don't like it. For me personally, it's not about being negative like i can't do something or oh woe is me because i'm such a productive person i want to better myself if i can't solve it i always ask my mentors or i always ask people around me and that's what i always do i think it's really important when you do have negative people around you is to separate themselves of you because it goes back to that idea of um, surround yourself with lions surround yourself with the people that have the same mindset if you want to be successful Surround yourself with successful people. If you want to be uh, anything, like um, a writer, surround yourself with more writers. Surround yourself with more scientists if you want to be a, more, a scientist. It's really important to surround yourself with the people that you have the same mindset. Um, going into how do you stop overanalyzing the situation and stop feeling guilty for everything? Ooh, that's really interesting. Um, Overanalyzing. I think everyone does over over overanalyze or overreacts to a situation, and I believe again, it's breath. It goes into um, for me the gratitude. It goes into um, the con the context. So a lot of guilty. A lot of people feel guilty because of certain situations, but what they don't realize is that actually they might not know the entire information. And so when you get anxiety you might have you might someone might be in an in an off place right they might be really really angry but again we don't know what it is so you might feel it and you might go oh i've really i've really hurt their feelings but actually you have no context to what's actually happening you don't know what's happening in their life so for me it's all about context and information about understanding what this what this uh, outside source is telling me what do i know what do i don't know and then my logic brain takes over because my emotional brain what will always happen is it will start panicking like a monkey will go ah 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 and then you start over analyzing and then you start getting anxiety then you start breathing and it's not about um in, it's not about breath it's not about stopping to breathe it's about breathing through it and thinking about it logically because our brain can just run off in an emotional tangent and then you get yourself in a a ta like a, and a whirlwind then we overreact um so uh tenya uh, i think it's tia so tia sorry tia i think his name is tia um how jamie do you have any advice for people in their 20s who are just starting out in their career path particularly in creative industry um best advice i ever got from someone is learn everything about everything learn how if you want to do filmmaking, learn how the first AC works, learn how lighting works, learn how a producer works, learn how a choreographer works, um, a focus puller, learn everything. I, I've always believed that every part of information that I learn, I will use in my life at some point. And so this is what I always believe. I think you need to be tentative and launch yourself into things because it's okay not knowing what you want to do in your early careers like they call them early bloomers so everyone who is successful really really successful maybe knew what they wanted to do when they were 15 and then you have late bloomers people who didn't find out what they wanted to do in their 20s because they were experimenting they're doing things and they were going oh well maybe i do want to do accounting and maybe i want to be a graphic designer or maybe i want to be a doctor or whatever it is and then suddenly they have a career change they pivot that's totally fine it's about launching yourself into those situations going, 
I wonder how an advertising like place works. I wonder how a writer works. I wonder how VFX works. And then all you do is reach out, reach out to everyone. When I first started out, I had coffee with everyone that I wanted to meet. I never took no as a personal thing. I always just thought, well, they must be really busy because they're really successful. But the truth is, if they're really, really successful, right, and they're up here, right, and we all see them on a pedestal and we go, this is someone up here and they have no time for me, then no one ever emails them. But if you're that one person out of everyone who thinks they will never answer, you might be that only one person that, 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 they, that you get the email to them they read it and then go, that's the most amazing thing. Because everyone else has gone, they'll never read it. They're too successful. But actually, these people who are really, really, really successful want to give time to people. They want to give you their moments. They want to give you their, their time to go for coffee. So that's the biggest advice I'd say is everyone to, it is human and everyone will give you their time. So reach out to everyone that you just want to ask questions. Go, how do you do your job? I'm thinking about this. How do I go in that way? How do I do this? If you're inquisitive and you're curious, you'll find your path. You'll find what you're passionate about. And I think that's really important to always keep reaching and never think no is a personal thing because no just could be it's the wrong time because it's fashion season or it's the Oscars at the moment and this actress is doing this or this director is doing that or it's a really big moment because we just want a job and we're pitching a lot of things. A lot of things are external. And so it goes back to you don't have enough information to feel ang anxious or to feel guilty that they haven't responded because they haven't. I remember I'm a really, really good story, right? was one of my first jobs in Paris and I, this is what happened. So I remember emailing the production company uh, who was, who's a really big production company in Paris and they do like things for, like, they do like the production for like Victoria's Secrets and they do these big shows. And I remember sending my email like in August, I think it was like probably like July, never got reply, right? Never got reply. And then I, I thought, okay, I'm going to wait another couple of months. So I waited another couple of months and it came to like November time and I thought I'd email again. I emailed again and then someone came back and says, actually, I, we, we had your email in July, but we just had no, we didn't have enough time to, to respond to it because it was so busy because of fascist season and all that sort of thing. And, I, and, and they were like, we actually really, really loved what you did, but we just didn't have enough time. Are you around uh, next week? Because we might be in London. I was like, yeah, for sure. So, uh, so within that time, they responded to my, to my email, my second email, I then got I then got the meeting next week, and just so happens that everyone, uh, all the offices around the world, were coming together for a Christmas party. Perfect timing, right moment, right place, trusting. I then meet the founder of the company. I have a meeting. It goes really, really well. He then goes, "We loved your stuff. Da, 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 da. Um, we wanted to meet you, but we didn't. Uh, we didn't have enough time." And then a week later, they offered me a job in Paris, and I was like, just trusting the process, trusting the future that it will happen and trust in going, be patient because sometimes it's just, they are really, really busy and that's a simple thing. So there's all the questions I think that's been answered. So I hope that everyone's had a really, really good time um, and really enjoyed uh, this process. And I really have as well. So uh, please tap into uh, 360 yourself and listen to all the amaz amazing guests that we have. Well, again, we're all um, on our social media. So we've got um, at 360, underscore yourself and tap into uh, Apple Podcasts. Please leave us some feedback because we love when you chat to us and we love when you engage with us and tell us what your favorite episode is. Tell us all these quotes and stuff. We, we love it. So I want to say thank you very much for uh, Othership and General Assembly for hosting me this evening. And thank you. <laughs> I popped up. Hello. Um, hi. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie, for giving such a good talk. I, for one, got lots from it. And like Jamie said, be sure to check out the podcast. Be sure to check him out on all his socials. And thank you to Othership for partnering with us on event on this event. Uh, you can check them out too. We will be, of course, uh, emailing you a recording along with all the relevant links um and any extra goodies uh, the guys at other ship and jamie have to offer in uh, the next couple of days so yeah thank you all for coming and have a lovely evening brilliant thank you so much bye bye